But I'm gonna, uh, what I'm going to do right now is inject the turkey. I, I like to use about a 12 to 14 pound turkey. I think it's the best uh, size for frying. It'll feed about 8 to 10 people, you know, depending on how you eat. Uh, but you use an ounce of uh, marinade per pound. And as you're injecting, you move your needle around. You go in the same hole with your needle. Don't make too many holes. But don't make too many holes because you don't want the marinade to leak, leak out. So you get down deep with your needle. Mm. Yeah. Cajun collagen. You sat with today's show how cool it is. You kind of like kept going on and on. I'm like, okay, dude, enough with the Cajun collagen. <laughs> and, uh, and then you just kind of move up. So you really want to layer the seasoning. Makes it look all poofy. I know it's poofy. That's a very technical culinary term. <laughs> if it's you gotta, if it's poofy, it's just right. And so again, like I said, you're gonna use about an ounce to an ounce and a half, depending on how you like it spicy. You're gonna inject the breast. And again, go in the same hole, but just come up a little higher. So again, kind of creating that layered effect, change directions to get your. And again, by by. It was really very ingenious, man, uh, because you, you know you're not only putting moisture in the turkey, but you're putting our, our Cajun seasoning in the turkey. So, I mean, the guys who you came with butter. Yeah, well, and this is the Creole butter flavor. That actually, the first one was made with butter. You know, a lot of and a lot of people still do. I got a buddy of mine who makes his own. He uses butter and uh, in his marinade. But I find it, you know. It's kind of like, you know, roux. This Ulamay Savoy, I've been making roux down in Papaloosa for 50 years. I don't mind using her roux every now and then. You go in just under the skin and below the, and above the flesh. Into the, well, you want to go deep He's at going first. deep in the meat. Okay, well, that's why deep. I asked the question. You, then you, know. stay, you stay in the same <laughs> hole. You stay in the same hole and you go, go yeah. different layers. So okay, yeah. I got you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Moving right along. <laughs> well, I sure hope nothing on higher on the food chain ever decides that taste better. <laughs> yes, sir. Does it do any good to do this the night before and keep it in the fridge? Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't Does matter. Does it add anything? No. Not really. I don't think so. I don't either. I don't, you know, I don't think so. I'll just study yeah. the show thing. Uh, um, I've never been a big fan of crawfish fat whenever I'm eating boiled crawfish, but like, does it make that much of a difference in an ate and bake? Yes, I think it does. Yes. You probably have been a fan of it because the crawfish were clean. Uh, because, uh, that, 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 that's a problem. The crawfish aren't clean, and they're muddy still. You may have just gotten the surface. And the high yellow fat. Yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Was that turkey icebox cold or was it room temperature? Icebox cold, but I took it out for a little while. I took it out for about an hour or so just to kind of let it take some of the cold off of it. Because especially with the uh, the electric fryer, because the temperature drops so drastically when you put the turkey in there. I like to let it kind of just sit at room temperature for about an hour, just to kind of take some of the chill off of it. I wasn't quite done yet. I was going to ask... Sorry. didn't mean to ignore you. No, no, no. I, I just wanted to well, say... We thought, you know, the crawfish fat question was the end. No, no, okay. Like, um, so next time that I eat boiled crawfish, if I were to save the fat and put it in the freezer, could I do that? Yeah. You know? yeah, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't freeze for hot. Yeah, it freezes for hot. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it now, crawfish, yeah, well, I mean, you don't want to keep it in there for a year. To oh, no, 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 I mean, fat. just... But, uh, uh, you know, no, it freezes well. Here's another thing. Professor. Here's another thing. There are new freezing, seriously, quick freezing processes that we have available to us now that we've done before. And now there are some crumpish processes that are, that are actually producing. Uh, 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 yes, Chef, I'm sorry. Vacuum packed crumpish tails that are, that are holding up. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, what's his name uh, in Eunice? <coughs> Dexter, Dexter, Dexter Gillery. Dexter Gillery uh, uh, came up with this process of uh, vacuum packing uh, the crawfish tails and freeze drying them real fast. And I tell you, we've had them, we've had them three, four months frozen, and I, I really couldn't tell them. And 
anything you want. You can slow defrost them under refrigeration. Anything, any seafood or any uh, frozen product, it's always best to let it defrost under refrigeration because what happens when you quick uh, defrost something, the ice crystals, uh, and especially in seafood this happens, the ice crystals kind of tear up the, the flesh. So if you just let it defrost real slow, the ice crystals don't do as much damage. If you notice that, well, I, I'm just a chef. I don't know. Is that true? No, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no scientist either. If you notice that, uh, if, if I play one on TV, if you defrost, <laughs> you use defrosted seafood, and you maybe inadvertently defrost it quickly, it tastes mushy. That's yeah, why it's all torn yeah. off. Yeah, because the ice crystals tear it up. But I'm not a big, you know, personally. It's probably one of the, you know. Frozen crawfish and frozen crab meat, not you know. No, I don't like that either. Especially crab meat. Man. I'm a big, I'm a big fan of eating things in sea. Yeah, I'm a big, big fan of eating things in sea. One of the few things that freezes well is shrimp. Shrimp, yeah, shrimp, shrimp. shrimp. I don't know why, but crawfish and crab meat just don't freeze well, in my opinion. And a lot of it is because the fat doesn't freeze well. It doesn't hold off. Up as long. Oh, oh, so we're no, no. no. I'm <laughs> saying that you no, know, it's okay to freeze it, but you might, you know, you might be picking up some tails that have been in the freezer for a year. You know, from one season to the next. So, you know, this is another thing that we we, we <laughs> no, no, yeah, I'm still right. Let's get that straight. <laughs> we didn't have any, we didn't have any freezers at all before, and then all of a sudden we have four or five. You know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, my friend Moisey Bodwan is one of well from from uh, Delcom. Uh, after Rita hit, we went out there to help them out. So we, we emptied their freezers to try to, because all their freezers were out. And I said, Boys, why do you have four freezers? Yeah, it's just him and his wife at home. <laughs> Jesus. And he said, well, you know, you never can tell. You? <laughs> well, yeah, I said, I can tell. You know, we got way too much. Yeah, so, right. so after I said, look, we, we, we got to save all this stuff for you, but you only get to buy one freezer. Buy one freezer. You only need one freezer. So you bought one freezer. We bought all this stuff. I said, give all this stuff away. Some of the stuff was, you know, 1997. <laughs> <laughs> so we gave it away. We gave it stuff from 1986. <laughs> uh, so I go over there uh, uh, on a visit. I said, boys, how many freezers you have? One. We have a couple. About a year later, we're back. I said, how many freezers you have? Well, I bought another one. <laughs> so. You know, if you notice, if you pay attention to what you're doing, a lot of times you dig in your freezer, there's some old stuff in there. It's not good. It's not going to be good. I mean, it works the same way on meat. Wild ducks, everything breaks down. Yeah, yeah, wild ducks too. I mean, I got, like I said, I, at my house, I mean, I have a little, I mean, I have a small, I, I like the uh, French door. I got the French door, the small freezer because I just soon go buy it. And you cook force it. yourself to cook it. Yeah. Force, you force yourself to cook it with a small freezer. I don't know how. I mean, I know some people who had big families and everything. And my mom, you know, everybody back in the day had a chest freezer. And that, that turns into like no man's land. <laughs> <laughs> Get to the bottom of that thing, all bets are off, man. How many times have you seen your, your aunt doing yeah, that? Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to ship away in whatever stuff you got in there. Well, look, what is this? <laughs> But uh, uh, get back to you, you know Yeah. Okay. Uh, get back to the gumbo story. Uh, one of the things that happens is this wonderful fusion of African and, and French traditions, which, which uh, so by which somebody said, let's push a roux. Pat was describing this. What do you call it? A, the uh, burmani. A blonde roux. Burmani means uh, handled butter or kneaded butter. Uh, and then you know there was a tradition in some parts of France of browning that, but very light. It was golden brown at best. And somebody said, well, you know, some plantation cooks, I guess, and said, well, if we, if we kept going on that, it would, it, would, it would do the caramelization thing that we were looking for in the gumbo thing. And so they ended up getting to that really dark chocolate colored roux, which serves to make gumbo when you don't have ochre. OK, keep going in the, in the time spectrum. You can make a gumbo the old way with brown okra, or this new fangled way with the French roux, uh, 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 a transformed French roux, both contributing to not only the flavor and the color, but also the thickness mm -hmm. of, of the gumbo. And so we end up with, and this is what I made for you tonight. It's a uh, gumbo with a roux base, 
and brown okra on top with an old hen and old pork old. and old <laughs> and pork sausage. That's a freezer for at least <laughs> she wasn't laying anymore at all. She wasn't laying anymore. And and pork sausage and this is another comedy like you see chicken and sausage gumbo, chicken and smoked sausage gumbo, chicken and andouille gumbo, uh, wild game gumbo, uh, chicken and oyster gumbo. You know, there's all kinds of combinations. Wait, chicken and oyster? Oh, yeah. I thought you had an affinity to the meat and seafood together. I, I had a, a version to it? A version to it. No, no, but I don't have yeah, a version here. I don't have a version here. I know. I know. But sometimes you can drop the oysters in the chicken. Because I specifically uh, uh, gave, I'm giving y'all a turkey smoked sausage and shrimp gumbo recipe. Because I thought he was a the, the purest that he is. No, no. <laughs> I thought you told me you didn't have this. You thought it was sacrilege to have <laughs> no, no seafood and meat combined. <laughs> no. What did you tell me? Did I, or did I imagine? Oh, chicken and shrimp. <laughs> you okay with chicken and shrimp? Yeah, so it's poultry. It's a poultry. It's a turkey. So poultry, chicken, and turkey. Turkey. Oh, it's a turkey. <laughs> but, you know, getting back to the gumbo for a second and uh, the bawling of the old hen, what was happening was, and the, and the Acadians, I, I guess, I, I got to believe that they knew, but maybe they didn't. Because they were using that old hen, uh, they were developing that stock in the pot. Right because they had to cook it so long. And that is the biggest mistake people make when it comes to cooking gumbo today. To this day, it blows my mind. I go to a gumbo cooking contest and how many bad gumbos there are there. Because people don't use a stock or some sort of flavor, even if it's chicken broth from the store to start your gumbo with and boil your chicken, even if it's a store-bought chicken. And that's what Pat's principle is, why put water when you can put flavor? Right, right. And I think that's the biggest mistake people make. And, and so by using that old hen, you're having to ball that thing, for, that, that, that gumbo for three and a half to four hours to tenderize that, that old hen, so you're actually developing that stock in the pot without even thinking about it. But a store-bought fryer, I mean, 45 minutes of balling, it's, fall, it's, it's falling off the bone, and people put way too much liquid. And even... The room, uh, people never put enough room. And always, another thing that's always blown my mind, I guess I get my mind blown a lot, <laughs> is uh, the, the room people. If you look in the back of, I wish we had a jar of room here. They tell you to put like four tablespoons of room to a gallon of liquid. I'm like, are you in the business to sell room or not? <laughs> but, I mean, James, I think you're shaking your head. It always, I mean, this kind of just puzzles me because the roux is not only is it it's another dimension of flavor because cooking good cooking is all about dimensions of flavor 